to uh, say something before we get started. Um, two weeks ago, if you were here, I made an incorrect statement, and so I want to correct that. I made the statement that uh, Jacob had never left the land of promise. Jacob had left the land of promise. He went to Hardim Aram, and there he found Leah and Rachel, and um, with them and their uh, maidservants, made his way back to the land of promise, and that is where Jacob resided until he was 130 years old, and then he left the land of promise and went uh, to Egypt. So I wanted to make that, um, that correction from two weeks ago. This is our uh, final sermon in this series called Foundations. It's uh, the end of Genesis. It's the 32nd sermon in this series. This book began, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This book ends, so Joseph died at the age of 110 years. He was embalmed and was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Those are the bookends of this wonderful first book. Of God's holy word. And in between those two passages is a wonderful story. A story of God's love, God's commitment, God's covenant, even God's judgment in the midst of love. It is a story of God's faithfulness to a people. And it's a wonderful story. So this morning, um, we're going to read a section of this, and I've put it onto the screen. 49, verse 33, and we'll read through 50, verse 3, and then pick up with verse 14. So let's read again. When Joseph finished charging his sons, he drew his feet into his bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Now for 40 days were required for it, for such is the period required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him for 70 days. Picking up with verse 14, after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt. He and his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So they sent him a message. A message to Joseph saying, Your father charged before he died, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgressions of your brothers and their sins, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive their transgressions of the servants of, of God your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers came, and they fell before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke to them kindly. Now Joseph stayed in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons, <coughs> also the sons of Melchor, and the sons of Manasseh, were born on Joseph's knee. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, 
But God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. So Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. May the Lord add blessings to the reading of his word. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. This passage records three burials. Two are literal, and one is figuratively. But all of them are important. I named the uh, sermon, Three Coffins and a New Beginning. I asked Bill Joyner last Sunday if he could bring a coffin and put it up in here. I didn't think that that might work. He probably would have done it if I pushed him, but I thought everybody walking in would thought they were coming to a funeral. So he did the next best thing. He, he, he brought a coffin. <laughs> so he handed me this this morning, his, his little coffin. So I'm going to place it here on my stand. Um, you, you can just know that it's there. Um, this... Three coffins and a new beginning. After the fall of man, we read over and over in Genesis, and so he died, and so he died, and so he died. And it goes on and on and on, and we have the very last verse of Genesis, so Joseph died. You would think that would be a terrible way to end such a marvelous writing. But it's not. I want you to see past death this morning and see a new beginning. The first coffin that is mentioned is the burying of the patriarch. Jacob died. The recording of his death covers more space in Genesis than anyone else that Moses writes about their death. In fact, there is more space attributed to the death of Jacob than almost anyone in the scriptures except for that of Jesus Christ. Moses, God, in inspiring this word, saw that it was important. This is a solemn event. Moses or Jacob drew his last breaths. He, he brought his feet into his bed, and it says he breathed his last. And then it says, if you keep on reading, Joseph fell on his father's face, and he wept at his father's death. We will see in this passage where they weep for 70 days, and that's not the end. When they go to Canaan, they weep for seven more days over the death of Israel. Weeping is okay, folks. I know that a lot of men think that crying shows weakness. But I can tell you, when it comes to sorrow, grief, and pain, crying, tears are a gift from the Lord that help us to process that pain. So if you hold it back inside, you're actually prolonging dealing with the grief or the death. Joseph wept over his father. Now before Jacob had died, Jacob had put certain instructions in place for his family. And uh, he wanted to make sure that his body was taken back to the land of promise. And so Joseph instructed the physicians to embalm his father. Now, there were embalming officials in the land of Egypt. Why would Joseph instruct the physicians to embalm his father instead of the official embalmers? 
There were pagan rituals that were conducted on the body during the embalming when the embalmers did this. Joseph instructed the physicians to embalm his father to alleviate those pagan practices from being done on his father. Forty days, it says, was the embalming process. But Pharaoh commanded all of Egypt to mourn the death of Jacob. Think about that. These are resident aliens in the land. These are Hebrews. These are Jews that have come from Canaan. Joseph himself. Look at the respect that Pharaoh has for what Joseph has done and for Jacob and his family, that he would command all of Egypt to mourn 70 days. Now this 40 days of embalming, the 70 days run concurrent, so there would be 70 days of mourning. And not only that, but Pharaoh instructs that the elders of his house, all the elders of Egypt, were to go with Joseph. Joseph requested to leave and take the family and go and bury his father. And Pharaoh agreed. And not only that, he sent a contingent with him. Jacob is carried by Joseph and all the family and all the caravan back to the land of promise. He is going to be buried in the cave that Abraham had bought from Ephraim the Hittite. He was going to be buried in the same cave that Abraham and Sarah, that Isaac and Rebekah, the same cave that Jacob buried his wife Leah. And so they went and at Atad, on the threshing floor, they mourned the death again for seven days. And then Joseph buried his father. Before we move to the next coffin, there's one verse that we do not need to skip. It's a great verse. It's the last verse of chapter 49. In verse 33 it says, When Jacob finished charging his sons, he drew his feet into his bed. He breathed his last. And listen to what it says. He was gathered to his people. He was gathered to his people. What a wonderful reminder of what God has done for those who have faith and believe. Moses is writing this book around 1450 B.C. of an event that happened around 1900 B.C. And Moses, through the inspired word of God, says that Jacob was gathered to his people. You see, you don't have to wait until later in the Old Testament. You don't have to wait until the Mount of Transfiguration to see Moses and Elijah with Jesus to realize that there's life after death. Moses, God tells us in the very first book of the Bible that there is life to come. Jacob is gathered to his people. What a wonderful promise. Every one of us ought to say, ah, oh, what a peace I find in that. That as a believer, even at the beginning, God reminded us of who he was. Joseph handled the respect that we have for the dead in burying his father. Respect goes by the wayside some today. I was reading last week about drive-by mortuaries. Have you heard of those? There's some in the Midwest. You can drive through, and the, uh, the coffin and the deceased is there, and you can view the body, and then you can sign the guest book and just keep on driving. It, 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 it just alleviates your time. 
I can't tell you the amount and how many times I've been approached as the officiant of a funeral. And my congregation would say, well, that family's just selfish. They should not have planned that on a weekday when I have to take off work. It should have been planned on a weekend. The respect that we have for the dead so often goes by the wayside. We can learn something from Joseph in the family. They mourn the death of the patriarch Jacob. And they buried him in Mount Paha, in the field, in the cave. The second burial comes in burying the past. This is the figurative coffin of this text. When they got back to Egypt, the scripture says that the brothers began to think, our father's dead. Our father was kind of the go-between, the in-between, the mediator between us and Joseph. Joseph is the second in command in all of Egypt. And they began to think, is he going to take revenge now that our father is gone? Is he going to take revenge on us for what we did to him? Man, I would want to say, reading from the 21st century, this text, did you forget what Joseph did? Joseph kissed you. Joseph wept over you. Joseph provided for you. Joseph told you that he forgave you. Did you forget? Why are you so alarmed that he may do you harm? The reason that they're alarmed is because they didn't believe it. They still held on to their past. They had never buried their past. They had never buried their past. Joseph cared for his brothers. He provided for his brothers. It would seem that it would have been better for his brothers to sit down and say, here's what we're feeling, instead of making up a story. They made up a story and sent it to Joseph and said, um, Jacob, your father said, you need to do this. You need to forgive our trans transgressions. But Joseph had already done that. Today, many of us fear for no reason because we haven't buried our past in a coffin. Many Christians today do not bury or believe that God has forgiven them of their sins. They hold on to their past. It robs them of the joy of their salvation as they live today. It is about faith. And Satan loves to play this game, saying that God could not forgive you of that sin or this sin. But Paul reminds us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord tells us that God has forgiven us. He has buried our sins in the deepest of the sea. We are not to doubt him. 1 John 5.13 reads, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. That you may know that you have eternal life. We need to bury the sins of the past. God has forgiven he has wiped them away. He expects us to learn from them, but to hold on to them is to rob us of the relationship that we have in a God who forgives us. Joseph was hurt by what had taken place, that they didn't understand or believe that he had forgiven them. Joseph summoned them to him. And they fell on their face and asked again for forgiveness. And he said twice to them, Don't be afraid. I've forgiven you. I'm going to take care of you. 
I'm going to take care of your little ones. Don't be afraid. This is what the Lord tells us today. Don't be afraid. Colossians tells us the old life has been buried and we can walk in the newness of life. The old life has been buried in Christ and we walk in a newness of life. When we bury our sins, our past, when we know that God has taken care of them, we walk in a newness of life, in a joy that only comes through the forgiveness and reconciliation through Jesus Christ. We have a new beginning in Him, and we walk anew. Have you buried the sins of your past, or are you still holding on to them? The third coffin is that of burying the Son. We come to the end of this wonderful book called Genesis. Joseph spent 17 years, the first 17, in the land of Canaan. He spent the last 93 years of his life in Egypt. 93 years serving Pharaoh. He protected the people. The people feared him, not fear, but in awe of who he was and what he had done. When he said to the brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, because he has protected, he's brought about life for these. And so Joseph was revered by Pharaoh and all of Egypt. Joseph brought his family together. He probably outlived some of his brothers. But he brought his family together with the one last request. And this he made them swear. He made them swear that they would take his bones, his coffin, his remains, out of the land of Egypt, back to the land of promise. And they swore that he would do that. They would do this. Over 400 years pass, and Moses, as they are delivered from Egypt, as the exodus takes place, Moses takes the remains of Joseph, and they travel with him and the contingent through the wilderness. And Joshua buries Joseph in Shechem. His request was honored. But I want you to think about this. Joseph dies. He's embalmed. He's placed in a casket. And he's placed in this coffin. He's put in Egypt in a temporary burial place. He is there so that all of Egypt, all of the, the Israelites, all the Hebrews could see him. And they pass this story on down generation after generation because those that swore that they would take his remains die. So they die. So they die. So they die. But his witness lived on. It was a new beginning. That's why it's not a downer to hear that Joseph was in a coffin in Egypt that finishes this book. It was a reminder to the Israelites of God's promise, His covenant, that they would be delivered. Even in Joseph's last words, he reminds them of the oath that was given by God, an oath given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they can look at that coffin. They can look and know that God is faithful, that God is going to honor what He has done the story is passed on from generation to generation to generation. For over 400 years, the story is passed on. And what was swore by his family came about. It should bring us great joy to know that a man or a woman of God 
has not finished their work in this world, even though they may be placed in a casket or a coffin. Because, see, your witness will live on. Your family will know your witness. And your children and your grandchildren will pass your story on of what a difference you made for them. This is God's plan. This is God's message to us as believers. The end does not come in a coffin or a burial place. There's a new beginning that takes place. Winston Churchill was a great man. And as many do today, Winston Churchill planned his funeral. He planned his funeral to a T. I mean, every intra part he planned. He had great hymns of faith of the church. He had great liturgy from the Anglican tr tradition that was read and spoken at his funeral in St. Paul's Cathedral. But Winston Churchill surprised those that day that gathered for his funeral. You may know the story. Churchill had a bugler in up one side of the dome. And at the end of the service, the bugler played taps. If you have ever been a part of a service where taps have been played at the end of a funeral, I don't know about you, but especially as a serviceman, as a veteran, my, my eyes just water and tear, and it, it reminds me of death. Taps is the final hour of the night. Winston Churchill, though, surprised everyone. After Taps had finished, there was a bugler on the other side of the dome in St. Paul's Cathedral, and that bugler began to play reverently. It's time to get up. It's time to get up. It's time to get up this morning. How awesome is that? I don't even know if Winston Churchill was a believer, but he understood what it meant to die and to live. The hour has come and gone, but a new day is dawning. We should live into that. That's the hope of the new beginning that we have in Jesus Christ. God has given us this promise as He had given the Israelites that He would deliver them and He lived into that promise and they saw the promised land. The sign for us is not an empty coffin, but it's an empty cross. It's an empty cross. And that cross is a sign for us still today of the faithfulness of God and for those who believe that reveille will come, that you will awake and live forever. You will be gathered with your people and with God. And folks, that's eternity. So Joseph died. Unless the Lord comes back before our death, every one of us, someone's going to say, so Marty died. So Rich died. But you know what? As believers, we have a new beginning. How great is that? That God would love us so much that he would give his only son we could have eternal life. Three coffins and a new beginning and every believer can claim it. Let's pray. Father God, thank you
for your promise of eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you that you remind us daily through the witnesses, the cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. Lord, thank you for those testimonies that have led us in the past and will lead us in the future. Lord, thank you that each of us come to a new beginning in our life as we accept you as Savior, Lord, over our life. And yes, Lord, we can joy and rejoice in our salvation. But Lord, we're going to rejoice one day and that rejoicing will never end. It will be a new beginning as we are gathered with you and all the saints of heaven. Lord, we thank you for your love, your faith, your promise. Lord, we thank you for who you are in our life. Let us so, Lord, be a witness for those who come after us. And we pray this in your name. This is how great our God is. That he loves us enough that he sent his son to die for us. And he wants us to be a witness to that in the world. So as you go from this place, go knowing that God will use you to show him to others in the world. And go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people can say, Amen. Amen. Join us for fellowship. Thank <laughs> you.